What's old is new again. We should be so lucky. That's this week on Motoring 2007. TSN's Motoring 2007 is brought to you by Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses and Michelin, a better way forward. Summertime for many means the cottage and the beach, but for many more, it's all about classic car shows. And this week, we're at the Fleetwood Country Cruise Inn, just outside of London, Ontario. Now, this is one of the newest car shows in the country, and many have been telling me that it could be the classiest. Well, we thought we'd drop in this week and find out why. This is only the fourth event. Last year was the third, of course, and uh, last year actually went world class. They came from seven states and seven provinces. It made the news on the BBC in Europe, as a matter of fact. We have George Barris's uh, seven custom cars here. We had uh, seven of his TV show cars last year. Uh, the charity component uh, came on board last year with uh, nine charities benefiting. 20 charities will financially benefit this year. To take the, the enjoyment of the hobby and incorporate it with the charity, it's just, uh, it's perfect. It's a perfect mix. He's worked pretty much year-round on this. I know Steve quite well, and, and uh, I know that, you know, he's already making plans for next year's show, and, and this show is just, just happening. So he's really committed to it. Uh, there's not a lot of help. He gets a lot of volunteer help uh, for event day from the charities. There's 20 charities involved and uh, he gets you know support for volunteers there but the actual planning the event uh, most of it he does himself and uh, you know it's a credit to him that it's uh, as successful as it is the first show was 400 cars and that was by word of mouth i just thought i put together a little get together and 400 showed and and then the next year 900 showed up and last year 2200 cars showed and it was it was wild here there were cars everywhere well, I'm like George Burns, I'm 39 years old, but I've been doing cars for 60 years. So it shows you that the car culture is really forever. So the wheels keep rolling and rolling, and I've had such a great experience from when I first started cars, pioneering way back in the 40s, where we first had to chop tops and channel cars and make them look a little different. Okay, good. All right. Well, it's exciting to bring, because not only we bring movie and TV cars out here to see, but we brought three of the most beautiful uh, award-winning cars in the USA from Jerry Kind in New Jersey, the Millennium 2000, the CCC, and our latest car, which is called the Shark Attack. It's a dual cowl Phaeton made off of a 38 Graham, and it's really an exciting car. It doesn't matter what kind of car you like, whether you're, you know, you're into classics and vintage or hot rods and customs or whatever. Uh, I, wa I wander around here, and, and I, you know, there'll be a couple of thousand cars here. You're bound to see some stuff that you like. Well, I really didn't think when I first started that it was going to be other than just a few guys. But as the decades kept rolling and the wheels kept rolling, each 10 years it just got bigger and bigger. And then I just said, well, like even SEMA organization, which is the automotive aftermarket, last year did $54 billion in cars of the aftermarket. So you can see the car culture of any sort in any way is here forever. Maybe an unfair question. Anything that you really like here? <laughs> I wandered through the uh, auction corral there this morning and, and made a list and uh, unfortunately there's things like a house and food and, and a wife that uh, probably are taking priority. But yeah, there's some cars here I'd love to get. I've been a gearhead since I was a little kid and I couldn't wait to sit on my dad's lap and steer the cars when I was probably 10 years old and up and so on and uh, to incorporate the old cars and love for the hobby with with uh, all these car people and friends and uh, the charity aspect and putting on uh, a world-class event, it, it's just, it doesn't get it any better. It's a, it's a great weekend. Now when I was a kid, this was the car I lusted after, Continental Mark II. What are we gonna lust after 25 years from now? 
More later on Kenzie's Corner. Of late, Hyundai has hit home run after home run. Next up to bat, the Veracruz, a vehicle that takes the company to a place they've never been before. While the Veracruz rides on a longer, wider Santa Fe platform, it is anything but a steroided version of its smaller sibling. The credit goes to the 105mm stretch in the wheelbase. Not only does this open up the cabin appreciably, it allows for a third row seat and a cargo capacity that's a match for the full-size Mercedes-Benz GL450. A maximum capacity of 86.8 .8 cubic feet. Unlike so many third rows, the Vera Cruises is actually usable as long as you're less than six feet tall. You've got decent headroom and you get decent legroom because you can actually move the middle row seats forward slightly. The drawback, the seat sits low to the ground which forces your knees up at an awkward angle. The other thing you've got to remember, this is still an either or proposition. You either have people sitting back here and no luggage space or you forget the third row passengers, fold the seats down and you've got a ton of luggage space. When it comes to power, the Vera Cruz is again a match for its intended competition. The 3.8 litre V6 engine, which comes complete with variable valve timing, pushes a strong 260 horsepower and 257 pound feet of torque at 4500 RPM. Throw in a six speed automatic with a manual mode, and the Vera Cruz has an athletic feel when it's launched off the line. The proof comes in the numbers a 0 to 100k run in 8.4 seconds and an 80 to 120 passing time of 7.1 seconds. The other upside is a test average fuel economy of 11.4 litres per 100 kilometres. Now this is very good, all things considered. The interior of this Vera Cruz is very nice indeed, especially if you go with the limited model. Then you get premium leather, a very nice sound system. In fact, you get everything you could possibly want up to and including a rear DVD based entertainment system that comes with a remote and wireless headphones. There is however one glaring omission. You cannot get a navigation system even as an option. I'm sorry, in a $50,000 car that for me would be the deal breaker. The bigger footprint also equates to a more civilized ride and better handling. True, this is not the sort of vehicle to pick if you're about to go hooning around a racetrack but when compared to its peers, it can stand on its own merits. The ride is comfortably cushioned and the amount of body roll well controlled. Normally, soft suspenders and a high seating position combine to exaggerate the body motion whenever a vehicle like this is pushed through the pylons. More importantly, there is a direct connected feel to both the steering and the manner in which the Vera Cruz turns into a corner. If you want to go off-roading in the Vera Cruz, it actually comes with some pretty good credentials. There's decent ground clearance, the approach and departure angles are respectable, and there's a lock mode for the all-wheel drive system. When you activate the button, it locks the transfer case, which splits the power evenly front to rear. The one thing that limits the off-road ability, ironically, are the tyres that work so well in the pylon test. They've got great lateral grip in the dry. You put them out here and clog them full of mud, and well, they don't work so well. The rest of the all-wheel drive system works equally well as it's proactive in nature. This means it deals with wheel spin before it has a chance to become a problem. Layering this with a good electronic stability and traction control system brings even better balance to the setup. There's also a good set of anti-lock brakes that produce excellent stopping distances of just 39.6 meters. Not so long ago, spending $50,000 on a Hyundai would have been outrageous. With the Veracruz, while it's not difficult to reconcile the cost if you look at the upsides. A wonderful on-road demeanor, plenty of flexibility and a third row seat that actually works, and a ton of content. However, the lack of a navigation system, well, it is going to hurt them in the long run. I suggest they get their corporate skates on and address the situation sooner rather than later.
Michelin, a better way forward. Recently, auto journalists from across North America were invited to test Michelin's new Primacy MX V4. It's called a performance touring tire, and it's at home on vehicles ranging from BMWs to Hyundai's. It's our latest incarnation of the legendary MX V4 line of tires. Holy. So among the many features that the Primacy MX V4 offers, we've got three main features that we believe will impress um, our consumers in Canada. First of all, we get more mileage out of this tire. It's got a 100,000 kilometer tread wear warranty on both H and V speed rated tires. Also, we get better control when we need it most. We've got advanced max touch construction, a feature that Michelin has developed and designed in this tire that allows for more traction and control, especially in wet conditions. And we've got a comfort control technology that really allows for reduced noise and a smoother, more comfortable ride for consumers. I was actually very pleased with the new Michelin Primacy. I found that it actually had a reasonable amount of grip as the car loaded up in turns. Uh, straight line stability was good, uh, braking was good, but uh, the thing that impressed me most was that as the car tended to lean and put weight on the outer tires in the turn, that they actually maintained their grip in a more linear manner than I'm used to for a tire of that category. One of the things we've learned to like about this long-term Rondo is its powertrain and the performance it delivers. Now the V6 churns out 182 horsepower and 182 pound-feet of torque, which is very good. Combine that with a five-speed automatic and you've got a decent powertrain. Now the advantage of having five gears, first gear is lower so you get off the line quicker and all the other gears are packed together tighter and so the engine stays at a roaring boil across a broad range. Now in terms of hard numbers, it'll get to 100k in about 8 seconds and it does the 80 to 120 passing move in about 6 seconds. Now that's wonderful stuff. More importantly, it actually allows the car to drive decently when you're using it the way the car was designed. Stick six people in this thing and it still accelerates. It doesn't turn into a slug like so many others. And that's always a good thing. In future weeks, we'll have more updates on this long-term Rondo. Ford is making investments in a variety of technologies because we don't believe that there is one silver bullet technology. We're heavily invested in clean diesels. Uh, we're working on renewable fuels like E85. And out into the future, we're also looking at fuel cells and hybrid uh, combustion engine technology. It was in the heart of the Toronto business sector where some of the world's largest automakers gathered to discuss the business of building green vehicles. The aim is to have uh, a forum where a really broad cross-section of global manufacturers have a chance to state their case. It is uh, often not understood by um, suppliers, consumers out there that, uh, that these companies actually do have technologies that they can sell in Canada quite easily. They already exist, except the fuel is too dirty to sell a lot of them, I, I, except that the infrastructure doesn't exist. And where, do you, where do you fill up with hydrogen? Um, you know, th these kinds of things. So the idea here is, is to express to the public and to the politicians that there are solutions to some of these global warming issues that are already available. What we need is some different approach to regulation, and, and what it boils down to is harmonize the regulatory standards. Our customers shouldn't be forced to make a choice based on a government program. We felt that you had to respect that we have an environmental reputation, that we also have a reputation for safety, and the customer shouldn't have to make the choice between the two. And here's what Natural Resources Canada says about running your vehicle on ethanol on a life cycle basis, so taking into account how much carbon dioxide is produced in making the fuel and how much in running the fuel. That if you switch from gasoline to E85, you will cut your greenhouse gases somewhere from 46 to 65%. There is no technology we're talking about right here other than hydrogen that is really going to make that kind of a leap. So we need more choice in fuels in Canada. 
and politicians are starting to talk about that. All of us, given all things equal, would yeah. always choose to buy a product that has a smaller footprint on the planet. So the issue here isn't whether or not global warming is man-made, that's over. The issue is which car company is going to win the, the, the race to paint itself as green as possible by offering products that really do make a difference. It's election season. Are you getting any sleep at night? Well, when you consider the environment used to be 4% in public opinion polls and it's now in excess of 45%, you know where the politicians are going to be coming from. And does that keep you awake at night? I sleep well. <laughs> <laughs> We're back at the Fleetwood Country Cruising just outside of London, Ontario. Over 2,000 vehicles here. In fact, they've even thrown in a few vintage trailers and fire trucks. And you know, one thing about this generation of vehicles, if you had car problems, you had a few tools, you could probably get that sucker back on the road once again. But what about today's cars with such high technology? I mean, was it really the good old days? Well, let's ask our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner. Brad, for sure, things have changed tremendously and they're still changing. And you know what, when you look at those, go to those classic car meets and look at, look at uh, vintage cars, you know, we always look at them and go, oh, wow, look at how easy they were to work on. It's too bad the cars weren't like that today. Well, the reality of the fact is that in order to get to where we are today and have a car that's uh, fuel efficient, produces lots of power and meets emission requirements. By nature, it has to be very sophisticated under the hood in order to achieve that. So the good old days are, well, the good old days, and they're well and truly gone. Now, in terms of working on modern cars, you know, there's pretty much nothing you can do as a roadside repair anymore. And of course, modern cars are very reliable. The odd time things go, but you know, when they do go, you better have a cell phone and a membership to the uh, Motor League or Auto Club because you're nine times out of ten towing that thing in if it broke down and you need sophisticated tools, equipment and diagnostic procedures and a shop environment to repair it and diagnose it. So you're not going to do it on the side of the road. The one thing that you are likely going to have to do on the side of the road sometime in the life of that car is install your spare tire because even if you've got perfectly good properly inflated new tires on your car, you can still run over a piece of debris, cut down a tire, and ruin a tire, have to replace it on the side of the road. So make sure that once in a while you go through the trunk of your car, or if it's an SUV or a van, make sure that that underslung spare underneath the back of the vehicle is A, there, inflated properly, serviceable, and ready to go. Do a, do a dry run in your driveway. You can get the uh, the cover out of the rear of the, the vehicle. There's the procedure for installing the spare tire. Make sure that it's that the jack is in there and, and working, that the wheel wrench is there and it fits the wheel lugs on the car. You've got that lock tool if you've got locking wheels. In other words, that you're ready to go. And of course, that that spare tire is properly inflated. In most cases, if it's a space saver, they call for 60 PSI, which is roughly double what the four uh, road wheels on your car call for for inflation pressure so make sure you're ready to go in the eventuality that you do cut down a tire and remember if you damage a tire and ruin it bring the vehicle speed down and get that vehicle slowly off into a safe area don't stop in a live lane thinking that you're going to save the tire or the rim slow it down and get it well off the road that's the most important safety thing till next week i'm bill gardner for motoring 2007. It's a 1930 Isotta Fraschini. I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Isn't that a beautiful thing? A lot of beautiful cars here at this Fleetwood Country Cruise Inn, and you've seen a lot of them on the show today. A couple of things that always occur to me when I'm at a show like this. First of all, a genius mechanic like Bill Gardner, he could fix just about any car in this field. Give him some bailing wire and some masking tape. Doesn't matter what the problem is, he's smart enough to figure it out. Why? Because the technology is all mechanical. It's easy enough to figure it out if you know what you're doing, and Bill clearly does. 
The other thing that occurs to me is, at a show like this in 25 years, are there any cars we're driving today that we're going to want to see in 25 years, let alone collect? It's not like something like this beautiful 77 Hornet. Wait a minute, that's my car. You really want to collect something like this. But is there anything you can buy new today that you expect to see 25 years from now at a show like this? Well, Bill's already commented on the difficulty of repairing today's cars today. And that's the other thing that occurs to me. 25 years from now, who's going to fix today's cars? Because by then, the technology is going to be so advanced, the stuff we're making today, although it's complicated enough, it's going to look like antique stuff to the mechanics of that time. It's sort of like going into a, a radio shack or whatever they call that store these days, and you take in a, a five-year-old computer and the pimply-faced kid behind the counter says, we, we never sold that. Oh well, yeah, you did five years ago, but now it's become so old within their context, they have no idea how to fix it. So what are we going to do 25 years from now when the Bill Gardeners of the world are no longer able to fix those cars? Well, maybe, Bill, you got to train your kids on how to fix today's cars because somebody's going to have to know. Because is there another answer? Well, maybe for the first time in 20 years? I don't know. I'm Jim Kenzie. It's not enough to host a car show in your backyard, but Steve Plunkett also brought in an air show. And those aircraft, by the way, are Harvard's my favorite airplane. Now, you've got to figure, to put on a big event like this, you've got to have a little coin. Well, Steve Plunkett's dad was a doctor, and he came up with an idea. It's called the birth control pill. Some guys have all the luck, but he's not the only lucky one. All the proceeds from this three-day event will go to 22 different charities. How about that? That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. I came to Canada in 2005, July, and I've realized that this market has a huge potential. Up until I came here, the operations was run through U.S. and the results were, as you know, not successful. TSN's Motoring 2007 has been brought to you by Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. And Michelin, a better way forward.